be seated. What a powerful name of Jesus. Are you glad that we serve the Waymaker this morning? Amen. Amen. This morning, friends, we are talking about coming to the table. Coming to the table. How many of us during the pandemic, we picked up some habits? We uh, started to uh, indulge in some television shows that perhaps we weren't watching before, but we had all of this time. So my family, we started to watch Blue Bloods. How many of you are familiar with Blue Bloods? So Blue Bloods follows this Irish-American Catholic family called the Reagan family, and they are a group of law enforcers. Some of the members of the family are police officers, and one member in particular is a lawyer. And I love this show because they are out there fighting crime and seeking justice everywhere that they go. But what I love most about this show is that every episode, they have a Sunday dinner scene. And at this Sunday dinner, they try their best to have a good conversation with one another, catching up on their week's events. But it always turns into a moral and ethical debate about the cases that they're facing that week. But what stuck out most to me about these Sunday dinners is four things. One, I loved how everybody has a designated seat at the table. Everybody has their spot that is their seat. Number two, I love that they always have a beautiful spread of food on this table. It is a feast to behold. They talk about who contributed which dish for this Sunday dinner. Thirdly, I liked the fact that when these four generations of the Reagan family sit down to have these Sunday dinners, every single member of the family is allowed to speak, irrespective of how old they are. And lastly, no matter how heated the debate gets at the table, and trust me, it gets heated, no one gets up from the table. They decided as a family that we're going to sit here and we're going to work it out, and somebody is still doing the dishes after this dinner. And so, I grew up in a family where we also had a Sunday dinner tradition. And I also grew up in a family where hospitality is one of the gifts that we operate best in. I know for me, this idea of having someone come to my home and preparing them a meal that's made with love and putting out this beautiful spread before them and having intimate dialogue at the dining table is one of the greatest joys of my heart. It's one of the best ways that I choose to spend my time. And even when I reflect on in culture, we have so many popular sayings and phrases that we use concerning family and concerning the table more specifically. So when we think about, have you guys heard the phrases where it's like, what do you bring to the table? Right? You've heard that one. And then we talk about going out to make money so that we can put food on the table. We talk about having a seat at the table. And sometimes even when a seat at the table has not been provided for us, we talk about building our own tables. We say often to children that you have to say if you could leave, you could ask if you have to leave the table, and your parents will say you've been excused from the table. In culture, we talk about things that are done under the table. Those are things that are underhanded, and we don't really want anybody to know about it. More recently in culture, we're talking about shaking the table, coming in and being a disruptor, really coming in and mixing things up. And y'all have heard about flipping tables, which I think Jesus actually originated in the temple. That when things get really heated, people start to turn some things over. And more anciently, we talk about, look at the ways in which the tables have turned. That's often said when there's been a change of who's sitting at the head of the table. And we say, my, 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 look at how the tables have turned. Tables in our homes, they represent family, community, gathering, belonging, and places ideally where communication, connection, sharing, and bonding can occur at the table. They are often central features in our kitchens, our dining rooms, our living rooms, serving as hubs that everyone has to eventually pass by during the course of their day. At mealtimes and on special occasions, they are the places where we extend ourselves to hold hands, say grace, and express gratitude to the people and the food that is at the table. Friends, I want to tell you today that tables matter. And I want to show you as we delve into the scriptures together how God has and continues to beckon us to his table. So let's go to the word. How many of us are ready to get into the word? All right. 
So I hope you have your Bibles with you and your notebooks and you're taking your notes and the word will be contained on the screen for you at times, but let's get into it. So we're going to start off in 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, taking it all the way to the Old Testament here. We're going to read this entire chapter. It's just several short verses. And this has to deal with King David. He has recently come into power after King Saul's reign, and he is having a conversation in his courtyard. 2 Samuel chapter 9, starting at verse 1, and I'm reading for you today from the English Standard Version, but whatever version you have is fine as well. And David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, try saying that 10 times, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servants, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. You see, Mephibosheth, he got injured at the age of five years old. We learned this earlier on in the book of 2 Samuel. His nurse, his nanny was watching him and she was running and she was carrying him and obviously some sort of accident occurred and that is how he got injured. We probably in modern day times we would say that it was probably some sort of spinal, lower spinal injury that he had that caused him to now be lame in his feet. So we know from reading this text here that Mephibosheth, this is the first time we're learning of him because we didn't really hear about him even during the course of David and Jonathan's friendship, but we're learning of him now. So he's Jonathan's son, which makes him the grandson of King Saul. And in prior chapters, pretty much at the end of 1 Samuel, we learn that there was a battle and King Saul and Jonathan, along with his brothers, died in this battle. And so Mephibosheth from our understanding, would have been orphaned in a sense. It's like your family line was wiped out that day on the battlefield. And here he was living in seclusion in someone else's home in a place called Lodabar. Lodabar literally means no thing, no word, no pasture. It was a place where forgotten people went to go live. It was a desolate place east of the Jordan River, but yet the people that were there were people of low estate. King David, out of his love for his late friend Jonathan, he was inspired to seek out any relatives that he could bless. And that is why he inquired through King Saul's servant Ziba, who then informed him about Mephibosheth's existence, but also his whereabouts. When Mephibosheth came before the king, King David told him four things. One, do not fear. Number two, he said to him that he would be shown kindness on account of his father, Jonathan. 
Thirdly, he was told that the land that he should have inherited from his grandfather, King Saul, would be restored to him. And number four, from now on, you will be eating at King David's table. Why was what he said, King David said to Mephibosheth, so significant? You see, friends, when there was a changing of the government in ancient times, and even sometimes we see it still in countries across this world, there tends to be a cleaning of the house, right? So we know that this was public knowledge because David ran from King Saul for so many years. It was public knowledge that King Saul was jealous of David because he knew that he had been anointed to be his successor. And so it was understood that there was a contentious relationship. So one would naturally assume that when King David ascended to power, he would want to annihilate and wipe out any descendant of Saul so that there would be no interference in his government. Usually people who serve in a previous cabinet, they're going to be removed from their positions. And in ancient times, they often were executed to guarantee that there would be no coups and no interferences. And you see, because of this practice of cleaning the house, this is probably the whole reason why Mephibosheth was injured in the first place. Because upon hearing that King Saul and Jonathan died on the battlefield, this nurse went running because she probably knew in her heart of hearts that Mephibosheth's life could have been in danger. And he probably was raised even with this idea that he needed to be on guard, that King David would one day hunt him down to annihilate him. But not so. King David... He is even resonating with this idea that there was this practice of cleaning house in verse 1 when he's saying aloud in his palace, is there anyone left from the house of Saul? Because even he was unaware if any survivors remained. King David telling Mephibosheth not to fear but rather to expect kindness would have been an unexpected response given the situation I just discussed. Because Mephibosheth was living in isolation far away from the palace in Jerusalem. And instead of expecting to be executed and hunted down, he was shown kindness. And that was his portion on account of who his father Jonathan was. Jonathan was David's best friend who loved him with a loyal love that even put him at odds at times with his father Saul. We also know from this passage that Mephibosheth suffered with a fragmented sense of identity and low self-esteem. You see in verse 8, how many of y'all that cut you to your core to hear somebody say, why would you even consider me? I'm nothing but a dead dog. Can you imagine how he felt about himself? And this could be for a myriad of reasons. Think about it. He lost his father and grandfather at a young age. He may not have even had a memory of the royal lineage that he actually came from. He has no memories of being a grandson of the king. But also being a person with a physical disability in ancient times often made one a social outcast and made it difficult for you to work. King David took this a step further because not only is he saying to him, I'm going to restore to you what you lost, but it was going to be a significant inheritance. This is a gesture of restitution that King David didn't have to do, but wanted to do. And it would have been unheard of because of the vast sum of wealth that we're talking about transferring here. To make the matter even sweeter, King David then commanded King Saul's servant Ziba and his family and his servants to till the land on behalf of Mephibosheth to generate produce and resources for him, even though Mephibosheth would never need to worry for the rest of his life about where his next meal was coming from. Could it be perhaps that this generating of resources and wealth would be for his son and his children's children for the future? Who knows? But Mephibosheth, in a moment with the king, went from being a crippled man living in a lowly estate to becoming a wealthy landowner with 36 people working for him with a perpetual seat at the king's table like a son. What a turn of events. So friends, I want to talk to you today about tables, as I said. And first and foremost, I want to let you know we're going to use this story and then continue to build it out, looking at other references throughout the scriptures here. But first and foremost, I want to tell you that there is provision on the table. Say it after me. Provision on the table. I want you to know that preparations have already been made. You see, coming to the table denotes that there's been an invitation of sorts. Someone, a host, has 
extended an offer to guests to come for a gathering at a set time, at a set place, and one can reasonably assume that a meal is going to be served. Sometimes that invitation could even be a parent in a home calling out to the children and the rest of the family saying, it's dinner time. There's an invitation to come to the table. And when you've been invited to come to the table, the arrangements have already been made and put in place. We see this theme of preparing tables early on in the scriptures, even from the ancient writings in the Old Testament, when we're talking about the setting up of the tabernacle, where God gave very specific instructions to Moses and later repeated them again to King David and later repeated them again to King Solomon. So let's look here at a couple of verses that show where tables continue to show up throughout the scriptures. Numbers chapter 4, verse 7. We're going to the book of Numbers 4, verse 7. And it simply says, And over the table of the bread of the presence, they shall spread a cloth of blue and put on it the plates, the dishes for incense, the bowls, and the flagons for the drink offering. The regular showbread also shall be on it. Let's jump over now to 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 48. This is now during Solomon's time. So Solomon made all the vessels that were in the house of the Lord, the golden altar, the golden table for the bread of the presence. Friends, I want you to note and give special attention to the detail that's given about what went on the tables. They were places where things of value were displayed. Note the excellency of the materials used to make these utensils. We learned throughout the book of Exodus when the original tabernacle was being made that the tables that were used in the temple spaces were made of acacia wood. They traveled from far and they were hewn out by master craftsmen. They were even affixed with rings of gold and poles of gold for ease and reverence in carrying them. You see, even the Levitical priests couldn't just grab tables and move them around. They had to be carried in a particular type of way. You see, it's not about the tables per se, but it's about what's going to be placed on it. In this case, the bread of the presence, or depending on your translation, it might be referred to as the show bread, was 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and it was to ever be before the Lord as a reminder of God's abiding presence with them. The other utensils that were used in the priest's activities were sanctified as holy and were made with great care, given that they were to be used in the sacrificial offerings to the Lord. You see, friends, it's not about the table, but what's on it. Let's go to Psalm 23. How many of us love Psalm 23? We've committed it to memory. It's David's psalm. It's about the, him being the good shepherd. Let's go to Psalm 23. I want us to be reminded that let us never get so familiar and so complacent with the word of God that it seeks to hold new truth and revelation for us. Where sometimes the things that we've read over and over again, let's believe for a fresh rhema word that we would see things with fresh eyes. Never become too complacent with the word. So let's look at verse 5 here. Psalm 23, verse 5. And David is saying unto the Lord, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You see, friends, David, he had lifelong experience with being surrounded by enemies. He ran from King Saul for more than a decade of his life. He knew what it was like as well, friends, to not be invited to the table. Y'all remember when Samuel came to anoint the next king? And he goes to Jesse's house, and he asks Jesse to bring out his sons, and Jesse brings out seven, but forgot that he had an eight. David knew what it was like to not be invited to the table. I want you to be reminded that when we think of the characters that we read of in the Bible, that they were people just like you and I, who experienced things like you and I. They were acquainted with rejection. They were acquainted with loneliness. They were acquainted with depression. They were acquainted with conflict. They were acquainted with family breakdown. I want you, when you read them, that you would read them with a human, compassionate lens and see the way in which there's nothing new under the sun. The things that they went through are things that we go through. And so here it is, David. He was acquainted with what it meant to run from enemies but also to be rejected by family, not being invited to the table. And yet still, God put a song in his heart and gave him a perspective where he could see you're the one that's preparing a table before me. You're the one that's providing for me in the midst of it all. You're the one that's invited me to sit at a table in the midst of my adversaries and experience blessing and overflow right in front of their faces. 
I want you to note here that God is the one who's spreading the table. He's the one that's made the invitation. He knows who will be seated there. He knows that your enemies are there. In fact, he invited them. He invited them so they could see him bless your socks off. He set the table. He brings the oil. His intention is always to bless in abundance. So I want us to jump over in Psalms now. We're going to go to Psalm 78. David's contemporary, Asaph, he is a writer and a musician, and he's responsible for many of the Psalms with David. And in Psalm 78, it's, we're going to read several verses in this passage here, but it's good, friends. How many of us know the word is good all by itself? It's good. So Psalm 78, you're going to read with me from verses 19 to 29. Okay, and I'm going to give you a little context here of what's happening. So Asaph is writing this psalm, trying to journey and chronicle the experience that Israel has had from ancient times, from the Exodus to present. So he's trying to say all of the wonderful things that God has done and how he's brought Israel out. The purpose of this is that the hope is that by reciting our history over and over again, the next generation and the generations that will follow will know where we're coming from. We'll know what God has done in times past because it gives you a signpost of what God will do in the future. So let's pick it up at verse 19, friends. So this is Asaph writing to the masses, writing to the children of Israel to remind them of the journey. So verse 19, he says, They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Like that's a light saying, right? But can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard, he was full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob. His anger rose against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his saving power. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven, and he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate of the bread of angels. He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he led out the south wind. He rained meat on them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. He let them fall in the midst of their camp, all around their dwellings, and they ate and were filled, well filled, for he gave them what they craved. You see, God had done so much to deliver the children of Israel from their Egyptian oppressors, and yet still there was doubt in their minds about his ability to provide for them now that they were in the wilderness. Ain't that like us sometimes? We get a little amnesia, a little selective remembering. God has done so many good things for us, for our parents and our grandparents. How many of us are here today because of the prayers of a praying grandmother, a praying grandfather, a praying mother or father, a praying neighbor, an auntie? Some of us are here on a result of those prayers, and yet still we forget at times where God has brought us from and all that he has done for us. And that's why we have to remind ourselves over and over again, look back over the years and say, oh my God, that thing that should have taken me out, that thing that I thought I was going to lose my mind over, that time that I thought I was going to lose all hope, but I dared to believe that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living, and I'm still here today, still standing. We got to remind ourselves sometimes, especially when the going gets rough. Because there's such a temptation to get so bogged down in the present that we can't see that the future is yet still before us. These are passing and light afflictions. And I know, friends, they don't feel light when you're in the midst of it. But trust me, some of those other things that you went through that you thought would take you out, you can look back now and say, whew, that was light work. And so Asaph is reminding the readers here that God has more than earned the right to be called Jehovah Jireh our provider. And he continues to show them through these daily miracles that there's nothing that he cannot do. What kind of God is this that can send down quail and manna in the middle of a wilderness, kept their clothes from wearing out, provided water from rocks while they're in a desert land, and yet still there was doubt. And so God has to just continue flexing on them, showing what he can do until they believe and know of a truth that he is able he is well able, and I want you to be reminded today as well that he is well able. He is our provider. Remember that if he's promised it, he's already prepared the provision for it. 
Philippians 4 and 19 reminds us, my God, I want you to say my God, make it personal. My God will supply all of your needs. Friends, that's not some, that's not a little, that's not one. Did you catch that? All, every one of your needs, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's the kind of God that we serve. He supplies every need, all needs. Nothing is out of the question for him. Nothing is too hard for him. Friends, there is provision on the table. Provision on the table. So I want us to look as well too and understand that there's also a posture to assume at the table. There's a posture. As I was preparing for this message, I kept coming across this phrase over and over again in the scriptures. And it was, it was often referred to with Jesus because Jesus, he loved a gathering. Some of y'all, we gotta be more social. We gotta follow the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Jesus loved a gathering. He loved a dinner party. He's a, he, I'm, I'm a lady after his heart, because that, that's where I thrive, at a dinner party. And this phrase kept coming up, that Jesus was reclined at table. And I kept saying, hmm, it's interesting phraseology, and it shows up so many times. What does that exactly mean? I wanted to get a picture of it, because, you know, when we're talking about ancient times, this is the ancient Near East, and when we're comparing it to our modern times that we live in, when we think about dining at tables, we're thinking about sitting at a formal dining table that's about yay high, and we've got these hardback wooden chairs, and it, you know, we have a particular image in mind based upon how we're living. But in ancient times, tables were much lower to the ground, and this idea of reclined at table, I want you to picture throw cushions and chaise lounges, and people just really luxuriating around this table here. This was a practice that came about from Phoenician and Aramaic princes. That's how far it goes back, centuries. And then ultimately, it moved on to the elite classes of the Greek and Romans, and then spread throughout the entire Mediterranean. They believed that this position of lying down to eat, being reclined at table, was good for their digestion and reduced bloating. That was their thought behind it. And so they thought eating in this extremely comfortable manner, it was also a sign of the ultimate form of power and luxury. But too bad for the elite because then the masses, the general masses were like, I'm going to copy that too in my house. And so eventually it just became modern day practice across the ancient Near East. It also, I want you to take note in comparison to the way in which now we're doing drive throughs and we're eating in our car and we're eating in our bed and we're eating while we're walking down the street, that this kind of lifestyle spoke to a leisurely pace. It spoke to not being in a rush, not being in a hurry sitting at a table and conversing and savoring that which is before us. Something for us to think about. Something for us to think about potentially getting back to. Maybe not the whole laying down at the table, but taking our time at the table. So I'm going to read you an account that comes from this time where Jesus was in this town of Bethany. He's at the house of a guy named Simon the leper. Can you imagine being named after your condition? Simon the leper. I hope that Simon had been healed during this time that he was spending with Jesus. But nonetheless, Jesus, he's not afraid of lepers, so he's going to go to his house. So he goes to Simon the leper's home, and we've heard this over and over again. There's songs written about it, that this woman comes in with this alabaster jar full of ointment. And she comes in and she anoints Jesus. And this story shows up in the Gospels. It's repeated in Matthew 26, it shows up again in Mark 14, and again in Luke chapter 7. And biblical scholars, when comparing these three accounts, they've debated for centuries about if these stories represented different women or were they all the same narrative but told from different vantage points with slightly different details provided. But now it's widely agreed that it all centers on one woman, and it's Mary of Bethany, who is the sister of Martha and Lazarus. So the account in Matthew and Mark are very similar to one another, and what we learn about those is that this woman, she approached Jesus, she had this alabaster flax filled with very expensive ointment. It was called pure nard. It came probably from like the ancient Far East and would have been extremely costly for her to have purchased and had in her possession. And we know from these accounts in Matthew and Mark that she anointed Jesus' head with it. We know that the onlookers that were there, so both the Pharisees that are at the table, but also including his disciples, they complained about how this display of love that she had for Jesus was a waste of the ointment. And they cited that it could have been better used to serve the poor. 
And we know that because they viewed it as a waste, they began to trouble her and scold her for this act of love. But friends, what they thought was a waste, Jesus called beautiful. And he was reminding them that they can always attend to the poor, but this opportunity to prepare him in advance for his burial, as he called it, it was a sacred, limited time only opportunity. And that for this act of her sacrificial love towards him, she would always be remembered. Now Luke's account, which is where I want us to kind of park, it paints a different picture with some different details that the other writers didn't quite pick up. And so let's turn to it. We're going to look at Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And we're going to read 36 to 50 because the word is good, so we're going to read it widely. And so Luke chapter 7, verse 36, and I will read with you. So one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. See our phrase again? Reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man was a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What a beautiful story. And there's so much happening there. We'll take a little time to unpack this here. So we learn that Jesus was invited to this Pharisee's home, whom we later learn is named Simon. So see, same guy, same story, right? And while he was there, this woman of the city, especially noted as a sinner, some would even go to insinuate that she was a prostitute, heard that Jesus was there, and she came uninvited to the dinner party. She came up from behind him at his feet, denoting that she was in a lowly posture. She was weeping, perhaps symbolic of her repentant heart or sorrow over her sins. She dried his feet with her hair. Usually they would consider women's hair to be their crowning glory, and yet here she brought her hair even before him in humble adoration. She kissed his feet in honor of the fact that she was in the presence of a king, and she anointed them with the ointment from the alabaster flask that he would later say was in preparation for his burial. The host Simon, he despised this display, and in his heart, he criticized Jesus' authority and discernment, questioning why Jesus would let a woman of ill repute touch him. But Jesus instead uses this scene as an opportunity to teach a short parable about debts being forgiven, to bring not only to Simon's attention, but to all who were sitting at the table that loving gratitude is the response of someone who truly knows what the master has done for them. Jesus turns to the woman. I thought that was so special that it was specifically noted that he turned to the woman, effectively bringing her in as the focal point at the table and compares the hospitality of the host Simon versus what this woman had done for him and concludes that she welcomed and honored Jesus' presence even more. This woman who was uninvited, who snuck into the party, who cast off all restraint in fear in lavishing her love on the only one who could make a difference in her life, was now being applauded and acknowledged by Jesus himself in front of these distinguished guests. Jesus tells her that her sins, even though they might be many, 
they were forgiven and tells her that her faith is what has saved her and now she can go on in peace. She came in on a mission, much like the woman with the issue of blood. Y'all remember that story? She came in stooping, maybe even crawling. She laid prostrate at his feet in worship and repentance, but she left out of Simon's house, walking with her confidence restored, with salvation and peace as her portion. You see, friends, there's a posture to have at the table. She came in humbly, but she left out whole. Jesus wasn't afraid to be touched by her. He was unbothered by her reputation. He was unconcerned about how she even came to be at the table. All that mattered in that moment was her why. What was her why? She wanted to be in his presence because she knew in the depths of her being, some way, somehow, that only Jesus could satisfy what she craved. And he wanted to meet her at that place of her needs. He wanted to provide for her much like he did the woman at the well. He wanted to provide for her something better than food and drink. Much like Mephibosheth, she didn't know what awaited her in the presence of the king, but he ended up doing so much more than she ever expected. That's the kind of God that we serve. He deals in exceeding abundance above all we could ever ask, think, or imagine. Friends, there's a posture to have at the table. But lastly, I want you to know that there is power in the table. There's power in the table. It is a place of transformative encounters. Some wonderful things happen when we're seated at the table. So we've been able to see, even in these short passages that we've gone through, that miraculous, life-altering things can happen at tables. We know that even from this world that we live in now, decisions are being made right now in boardrooms that we are not even privy to that will impact all of our lives. There's power that's happening in the table. Research shows that even for families that eat together at least four times a week, the children are less likely to struggle with obesity, eating disorders, substance abuse, and they have an increased sense of self-esteem, better social skills, reduced rates of anxiety and depression, stronger feelings of connectedness, greater resiliency to deal with the problems and challenges of life, and higher academic performance especially if parents are able to keep the TV and the cell phones at bay during these communal meals. Christian author Shauna Nyquist has this beautiful quote that I love about tables, and she says, this is how the world changes. Little by little, table by table, meal by meal, hour by hour. This is how we chip away at isolation, loneliness, and fear. This is how we connect in big and small ways. We do it around the table. I'm telling you, friends, there's power in the table. So if we navigate the opportunities that present themselves at the table well, we set the stage for learning, for healing, for reconciliation to take place. I want us to look at a passage in Luke 14. Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to read for you starting at verse 1. One Sabbath, when he, this is Jesus, went to dine, once again, y'all, he's going to a party, dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees. They were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Jesus was once again dining with the Pharisees. And even though he knew they were his ardent critics, he knew they were also curious about him. That's why he kept getting these dinner invitations, because they wanted to be around him to see what he was really about. But they were always looking for a chance to entrap him. And there was another guest that was at the table who had dropsy. I didn't even know what that meant, y'all. I had to go look that thing up. And dropsy is what we would call edema, swelling of the body, fluids under the skin. So can you imagine, Jesus comes to this dinner and comes to sit at a table, and there's a man at the table who is infirm, struggling with a condition that he's had for some time. And Jesus almost became righteously indignant at this table, saying, we're really just going to sit here and have cute dinner when this man has a situation that I can immediately speak to. But because of your religious mindset, the Pharisees that are there, 
it's going to be scandalous for me to take action. But Jesus did it anyways. He did it anyways. He was frustrated at their silence because he questioned them even before he did it. And he took this man out and healed him and sent him away. You see, friends, for that unnamed man with this physical condition, coming to the table that day for dinner and having this encounter with Jesus changed his life. And it mattered more about what happened between him and Jesus at this table than whatever was being served for dinner that night. You see, there's power in coming to the table. I want us to look a little further down in Luke. We're going to go to Luke chapter 24. We're going to read verses 30 and 31. Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 30. This is Jesus. Once again, I want to give you some context. This is post-resurrection. So he is risen, and Jesus is having a ball of a time revealing himself to people in the most random of ways to let them know that he is indeed alive and well. So in verse 30, he says, When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn with us, within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, those who were with them, gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. You see, this story takes place, like I said, post-resurrection. Jesus is joining these two travelers. They're walking to a city called Emmaus. And he joins them, and they're talking about, oh my goodness, all these things that have happened in the city. Can you believe that this great man of God was killed the other day? And Jesus walks up, and he, he acts really aloof and says, what are you all talking about? And they said, where have you been? Have you been under a rock? You haven't heard this story? And they say, let's tell you all the details. And so Jesus walks with them, and unbeknownst to them, they are talking to Jesus himself. And he's acting all interested in the tea. Tell me what happened, what went on. And they're just saying, oh my goodness, the city is in upheaval here. And they walked so long that it began to get late. And Jesus acted. I love how the scriptures even said, you, gotta, you have to read the whole chapter. Go back and read Luke 24. Read the whole chapter. But Jesus, he pretended that he was going to go on like, oh, it was good talking with you all. I'm going to keep going on my way. And they said, no, 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 no. Stay with us for dinner. Come dine with us tonight. He said, okay. So he goes and he dines with them. And that's where we picked up. And they never really clued in that he was the one that they were talking about until it was time to sit at the table. So Jesus accepts this invitation to go eat with them, but it was only in the act of the breaking of bread and blessing it that his true identity became apparent to them. In a moment at the table, there was realization and there was revelation. They reflected on how this thing was resonating with them along the journey, but they couldn't quite put their finger on it. You see, like when they go to testify later to the disciples and they say, ooh, our hearts were burning within us when we were walking and talking about the scriptures, but I didn't know it was him. Friends, I want to remind you, let us not have a form of godliness, but yet deny the powerful presence of God in our midst. We're talking about him. We're talking around him, but we're not ever truly knowing him. Let that not be said of us. How many of us want to know him in fullness, in power? You see, their revelation, when they realize, because the scriptures tell us he vanished from their sight. As soon as they recognized it was him, Jesus just did a houdini and disappeared on them. Just all of a sudden they were like, our friend was here at the table and now he's gone. And so they got up. It says immediately they got up and they went into the city and they found the 11 remaining disciples and they said, he is risen indeed. We saw him for ourselves. The same is also true for us. You see, like when we come to the Lord's table, like the early apostles did with Jesus at that last supper, we know that the bread, it's symbolic of his body and the wine is emblematic of his blood that was shed for us. So when we take and eat of these elements, we do so in remembrance of who Christ is and what he has done for us. He became known to them only when he went to break the bread. It happens for us too in our interpersonal relationships, that we come to know one another in a very powerful way when we take the time to break bread with each other, dining at tables, fostering an understanding of one another in a way that's going to breed compassion 
and camaraderie. There's power, friends, in coming to the table and breaking bread with one another and our Lord. Lastly, I want us to look at Mark chapter 16, verses 14 and 15. So this is all in this same post-resurrection context where Jesus is popping up and showing himself to different people. He had shown himself to women first, the women who came to look for him. He revealed himself to them and then continued to show himself to many others. But now it was time for him to go back to his disciples. Mark 16, reading at verse 14. Afterward, he, he appeared to the 11 themselves as they were reclining at table. And he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. Can you believe it? These people traveled with Jesus for three years. The man told them repeatedly that he was going to die and that he was going to come back again. And when he actually died and rose again and people told them that he rose again, they were the people who were the biggest debaters about it. And yet still in verse 15, he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. The table in this setting here is simultaneously a place where there can be correction one moment, and then the next moment, because of the love and understanding that's been fostered through relationship at the table, they're being commissioned to be Christ's very own ambassadors. All of that happened at the table. You see, rebuke and restoration can happen at the table. It's the place where we can make mistakes, but also learn from them and never lose our seat in the process. Like our friend Mephibosheth learned, the table is where identity and inheritance can be restored, where the old narrative of being a person without word or pasture can be replaced with a reminder that he was a descendant of a king and where the king has decreed something over your life, he has the ability to change your address and destiny by the incredible power of his word. All of that power is present at the table. So the conclusion of the whole matter, friends, is that in these passages where we've been discussing the function of tables and how those who are hosting or sitting at the heads of these tables conduct themselves, I want us to get a picture in our own minds about how our Heavenly Father uses these illustrations to tell us something about Himself. You see, God is the greatest King. And from the beginning of time, He has been inviting us to come to the proverbial table. You see, where God is, there is already provision at the table because he has already made a way. We talked about the way maker this morning. He's already made a way by making preparations for anything and everything we could ever have need of. You see, where God is, there is a posture to assume at the table because God wants us to come with humble hearts but yet with a bold confidence of knowing that there is grace and mercy available to us when we come to his throne in our time of need. Where God is seated, there is power in the table because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And aside from him, there is no other. Only he can decree a thing and it be established. He can command and it be done. He can say, let there be and it was. For all the tables, friends, that we have been denied access to, tables that we were dismissed from, or tables that we had to get up from because love was no longer being served there, isn't it a relief to know that the God of the entire universe had made space and reserved a seat just for you? And I leave you with this final verse coming from Luke chapter 13. Verse 29 and 30. I'm going to give you a little context for it, but it, with all things, read the whole chapter because the word is good. Jesus is talking here about the fact that there's a narrow gate. And he's stating that those who don't truly know him as master, they'll be shut out if they don't take this narrow gate passway, passageway. And that they who take this narrow gate are the ones who will be welcomed into the kingdom of God. And so, verse 29 of Luke 13 says, people will come from the east and west, from the north and south, and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. What a beautiful picture of every language, every tribe, every nation, from every corner of the earth coming together 
to recline and dine at the table in the kingdom of God. God is asking us to lean back like the apostle John did when he laid on Jesus' bosom and find that in that reclining at table, there is rest, there is safety, there is support, there is nourishment, there is healing, there is miracles, and there is even deliverance at the table. There is a blessing in the last days, friends, for those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the remarkable thing about it all is that the invitation has already been extended to each and every one of us, but the decision is ours to accept. I want you to know that it's not too late for you to RSVP and take up your rightful place at the Lord's table. He is patiently waiting with arms outstretched, whispering to you, the meal is ready to be served, please come to the table. On your feet, church. How many of us are gonna leave out of here thinking about tables a little bit differently? A little bit differently. I hope that what really rings home and true for all of us here is this idea here that God has and continues to beckon us to come to his table. Our word over this house for this year is family. And we know that, that, that that's a layered word for many. But thanks be to God that even in the house of God and in the family of God, we have the opportunity to get a do-over and to do family differently than maybe how it was originally given to us. And so I know for those watching online and for those who are here in the midst, perhaps this talk about table and family is foreign to you. This idea of being invited to God's table isn't really making any sense to you, but your interest has been piqued. And for some, you have once sat at the table and you excused yourself. And maybe you've even been running from the table. You've been hearing the Father calling, but you've been running. It's not too late. It's not too, it's not too late. Today could very well be your day of salvation, your day of saying yes to the family of God. And it's so simple, friends. It's so simple. First and foremost, you just got to believe. Believe that God is who he says he is. Believe that he sent his son Jesus because he loved you so much. That Jesus came and he paid the price for my sins, for your sins, for everything we've ever done and everything we would ever do. It's already been paid for. It's already been covered. He paid a blood price for us because we're that valuable to him. And so we just got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is Lord. We want to confess the fact that we know that we are sinners. But thanks be to God that we can be saved by grace. Not of works. You ain't got to work and hustle for this thing. You're not jockeying for worthiness. God says he loves you just because he made you in his image, in his likeness. When we sang, when Pastor Paul was giving that, that verse that's been resonating with that, him all week, this idea that we become more and more like him. We become transformed more and more into the image and likeness of who he is. That can be possible for you today if you would only say yes. And so we confess that my old way of doing, being, and thinking, it's not working for me. Father, I want to come sit at the table. I want to learn of you. And so, friends, today we have an opportunity to accept the free gift of salvation, to accept the fact that Jesus has already paid it all, and there's nothing that I need to do to earn his love, and there's nothing I could ever do to lose it. And so pray with me, family. Father, we thank you today for the gift of salvation. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son, that through his death, through his resurrection, we could have life eternal with you. Thank you that you've come to cleanse us today of all unrighteousness. You said that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Thank you today. We receive your forgiveness. We receive your love. We confess that we can't do this life anymore on our own terms. But God, we want to live for you. And so we ask you today to come in and be Lord over our lives. Come in and transform renovate our lives from the inside out and make us brand new. 
We thank you for the invitation to come to the table and we say yes today, Daddy. We say yes to coming to your table. We wanna come and recline and dine with you and experience the provision that you have for us. Experience what it's like to lean back in your presence and know that we're safe. Experience the power that you've made available for us. And so thank you for inviting us to the table today. We say yes to coming and dining with you for all eternity. In the matchless name of Jesus, we say amen and amen. Mark, thank you.